This morning, uh, let's explore. I want to explore what it is to identify with life itself. To identify with life itself. You know, to go beyond a separate sense of identity. You know, for me, my separate sense of identity is I'm a woman, I'm a minister, I'm a musician, um, I'm a teacher. But before that and beyond that, I am life itself. I am life itself. I am existence, consciousness, blissful beingness. That's my true nature. And as I let myself out of roles, you know, out of being a separate drop in the ocean, right, the drop that popped up and when the tide was coming in, I opened to being the wide open ocean. I love that Gary picked up on that line in my song last week. Um, I am flowing towards the wide open ocean. There is so much love, so much devotion. Surrender is all I can do. I am open. Take me home. Take me to where there is nothing but freedom. Freedom. Mm. Yes, I am that. Life itself, you are that. Life itself. That was Gary's message and we could feel it. We could feel it. It was so beautiful and inspiring. Before you were a counselor, before you were a chiropractor, before you were a CPA, and after, <laughs> you are life. You are life itself, right? Um, Gary, I love this book, Universal Human. It's funny that I never read it. Read it. Well, it only came out three years ago, but um, I am really loving it now, especially now that Gary and I have reconnected. And there's a beautiful line. I'm going to quote it a few times today, but there's a beautiful line. A universal human identifies with life, life in countless forms. It identifies with all that is, for life is all that is. I have a song called Holy Presence. I'm going to have the choir learn it uh, in a couple weeks. But what is, what is holy? but to be whole, to experience wholeness. And to me, the widest, grandest uh, definition of wholeness is to feel one with all that is, right? So we can identify with our roles like we're in a play, right? We're in a play and we're playing a part, but we don't forget who we are. There's a passage from the Kata Upanishad, my favorite uh, Upanishad. And it reads, may we light the fire of spirit that burns out the ego and enables us to pass from fearful fragmentation to fearless fullness in the changeless whole. Did you get all that? <laughs> yes. May we light the fire of spirit that burns out the ego and enables us to pass from fearful fragmentation, from feeling separate from feeling me and you, right? Into feeling we are, I am, infinite light, the one. Michael Singer calls it the inner roommate. Anybody notice that you have an inner roommate? It's a voice in your head that won't leave you alone, especially in the middle of the night. And it's always focusing on worry, isn't it? It's always focused on what to be concerned about, what to fear, it really inspires a lot of worry. Eckhart Tolle calls that the egoic mind. Um, two weeks ago, I spoke on equanimity. And part of developing equanimity really depends on us being less identified with all of our roles, right? With, with all of what we think we are. Because when we're less identified with it, we're less reactive. And, Tolley writes about that really well. He says, non-reaction to the ego and others, non-reaction to the ego and others is one of the most effective ways we not only go beyond ego in ourselves, but also dissolve the collective human ego, right? So I have a funny, I have kind of a funny example. Um, so I was singing, I was rehearsing a song uh, a couple weeks ago, 
and uh, a friend was there. And after I finished singing the song, which I wrote fairly recently, a song I really love, my friend said, you know, I like that song, but I think there's a couple of lyrics in there that you could change, you know? And this person went on to tell me, you know, where he would change the lyrics, right? In a couple of spots. And uh, <clears throat> I said, you know, I'll think about that. Because he offered words, other words, right? And I did think about it. I didn't change the lyrics. <laughs> but I did think about it. And what was funny is there was another person present. And, and um, later on, we were together. And that person said, wow, do you think that person should stay in their lane? You know, he was in a playful way, you know, saying, you know, are you OK? You know, how do you feel about that? And, I, and that's when I realized, I, I, I'm really, I feel fine. I'm OK with it. And that it really didn't bother me. And my friend thought that it would. You know, he was expecting me to, to be more bothered by it. So it was so refreshing in a way. It's so great when we see that we've grown. Do you have those moments where you realize, wow, I am making progress? <laughs> and it was just such a great chance to practice the equanimity that I spoke on two weeks ago, right? Hmm. So if we come from the egoic mind, we can really be triggered by the ego and others, right? But if we're identifying with life, there's all this spaciousness there. There's, um, you know, a lot of spaciousness. There's the I am verse, versus I am, you know, important. I'm a songwriter and I'm offended. <laughs> so bugger off, right? <laughs> So then we actually help humanity. We help all of humanity transcend. It reminds me of the first time I uh, landed in India. I think it was 1994. I, um, I was in Madras. They have another name for Madras now. I can't remember what it is. But anyway, oh, Mumbai, Mumbai. So I landed in Madras, and on the wall was painted. It was a quote from the Bhagavad Gita, and it said, learn to take praise and blame the same. And it was as if, I, I just have never forgotten that. It was in these giant letters on this wall. And I thought, oh, we need that, we need, we need that in airports in the United States, you know? <laughs> I'm in India. This is not the US. <laughs> but I just, I just never forgot that. You know, it's a, it's a teaching on equanimity. It's a very, very deep teaching. And it really depends on where you're identified, right? It depends on where you're identified. So, you know, if you're free inside, then whether you're praised or you're criticized or you're celebrated or you're not, you're at peace. You don't lose your peace. Now, I am all for healthy boundaries. And, you know, I, I do teach workshops on healthy boundaries in my retreats. But as we evolve, we can respond versus react. You know, when we're less identified with our ego, we can watch ourselves. That's what I did when, when that person first said that. I watched myself. I watched myself. And there was like this split second where I just shifted. And I, I just went, I don't have to react to this, you know? You're not a songwriter. <laughs> I have 12 albums. <laughs> I've written hundreds, actually thousands of songs, right? My mind started, and then I just took it by the reins over here. You know, breathe <laughs> and respond instead of react. May we light the fire of spirit that burns out the ego and enables us to pass from fearful fragmentation to fearless fullness in the changeless whole. The fearful part of the ego is what needs to defend itself, right, when we react. And, you know, it wants to say, you know, I'm a songwriter and you're not. You're out of line, right? But, you know, it's, it's, it's this inner guidance that I trust that tells me I have nothing to prove, that says breathe and relax, right? Watch yourself. So a lot of suffering is created when, when we react, you know, negatively to whoever threatens our idea of who we think we are, right? You know, but, you know, if we're life, and we're more conscious, we start to realize it's just someone's thought stream, right? It's just someone's opinion, right? It's okay. I can allow for that. I don't have to react to it. 
I don't have to buy it either, you know, but I don't have to react to it. So I find it helpful to hold our journey in a lot of compassion. I speak on that a lot. Um, you know, we get lost identifying with form. That, that actually is part of the play, right? That's what we're doing here. Um, and to hold it with compassion and see it as a play versus, you know, pile on the self-judgment, right? I think we could, we could use more laughter. We need more laughter. To just laugh at how we're playing in form and we forget we're playing, right? It's part of the play, right? I find it ha fascinating how humans like to play with identities. Um, in the truest sense, life or God or source is having fun, being infinite myriads of forms, being you and you and you and you, <laughs> right? And trying on other identities is something that humans really have fun doing, especially on Halloween in Ashland. <laughs> I have never seen a better place to be for Halloween. You guys on Zoom, you got to come here for Halloween. But like for instance, this uh, this past Halloween, I was I was the, watching the parade, and there was a person. You might have seen them. They were they were a chest of a chest of drawers. They were wearing like this big boxy dress, chest of drawers, and um, they had like a clock, and they had their head was a lamp, and they had a lampshade. And on the front it said, one night stand. <laughs> there was, you know, a woman in her 70s. It was great. I loved it. And then there was another group that were aliens. They had these blow-up green things that looked like they were in the middle, but the blow-up outfit was an alien holding them, so it just looked like a whole bunch of people being abducted by aliens. <laughs> Well, that was fun. And then, there, and then people even like to change the identities of their dogs, right? Their pets. So one little dachshund, he was wearing this thing where he had a hot dog bun on his back and relish and, and mustard and ketchup and, and onions and, you know. So it's, it's, it's play, right? It's play. And there's a word in Sanskrit for divine play. What is the word? Do you know the word? Leela. <laughs> yes, we are the one playing in myriad forms for joy, for the fun of it, for expression, for the ecstasy of outpicturing our creative nature, right? Sri Aurobindo, who I quote often, he wrote, the world is a mere spontaneous creation of Brahman. It is Leela, or sport, of Brahman. It is created out of bliss by bliss and for bliss, right? We have to remember to play, that we're playing in form, right? And the joy that we find just in playing roles and changing it up, playing with other identities, like being a dragon or being an alien or being an elf princess, <laughs> which I've seen you as an elf princess, Lark. You're a perfect elf princess. <laughs> That joy is like a tiny drop of the joy that the one that gives all life feels being all that is. It's this immensity of bliss. And so the thing for us to realize is that we are that one. We can know it. We can open to it. But what gets in the way? What gets in the way of us feeling divine bliss or knowing oneness? You tell me. What gets in the way? What? Fear, Fear. Attachment. ego, attachment, the mind, the mind. computers, computers. Oh. iPhones. <laughs> what is that? Rushing. Rushing. Right, not being in the present moment fully. Good one. Yeah. Yeah, and what else gets in the way is that we think we are just this little self with its, with its needs and its problems, right? So how do we break out of our self-imposed limitation? We have the highest desire. We have the highest intention. We want to know what would it be like to identify with life, with all life, all the time. What would it be like? And we... We want that. We want that. 
So we work on ourselves. We become more response-able. Love that word. And we become attuned to our inner emotional state. We become skilled at feeling our feelings and taking care of them. We become less reactive and more response-able. Unity has a teaching. I think I might speak on this next week because it's a great teaching on four states of consciousness. The victim, the victor, the vessel, and verity. Are you all familiar with this? Such a great teaching. So the victim is, oh, life does this to me, right? Life does this to me. I am powerless. I have no power. I'm a victim. Um, you feel like you have little control. The, the victor is when you start to feel that you have some ability to control and affect the world around you. The vessel is make me an instrument of thy peace. When you feel like the instrument and the divine, which is still out there, is playing you, right? It's still something we, it's a subtle separation still. And then verity is when we realize oneness, when we truly feel I am that, I and the Father are one. I can't even say, make me an instrument. I am that. I am that which blows through the instrument and the instrument and the music, right? I, I love how Gary, um, in his book, Universal Human, he describes the difference in being a child of the universe and an adult of the universe. And I really appreciate Let me read you what he wrote. I put it in the newsletter. <clears throat> Children are helpless. Adult citizens of the universe are helpful. Children do not know when the snow blows against the window. They only know they're cold and they cry for help. Adult citizens of the universe close the window, turn up the heat, or put on a coat. I love that. Because we feel empowered. We aren't a victim. So I really see growth as this process where we grow in our faith and our trust in ourselves. It's little steps, Ellie, right? You know, it's like in that movie Contact, little steps. To trust in ourselves, to feel more empowered, not by the ego, but by life itself, aligning with life itself. And that's where Gary starts to talk about the authentic power is aligning with life itself and letting that live you. Right? And then life starts to feel more like a dance. Oh, the universe is twirling. I, I, it's time to twirl. And I'm going to spin for a little while and see where I land and trust the unknown. Right? Less and less fear and more and more trusting the unknown. There's a poem by Hafiz. I love about dance. He's always talking about dancing, the cosmic dance. Let's dine tonight with exquisite music. I might even hire angels to play just for you. Look, hidden beneath your feet is a luminous stage where we are meant to rehearse our eternal dance. Look inside my playful verse, for Hafiz is barefoot and dancing and in such a grand and generous, in such a fantastic mood. <laughs> Play, <laughs> dance, love life, joy is what God is, bliss, lots of joy. I mean, a lot of joy. <laughs> so we can ask, what is mine to do today to, to more fully live the truth I know? You know, how do I consciously apply my love of life to the flowering of our human species, right? It's so important to examine what we identify with, right? Are we identified with being a little human stuck and going to stay stuck? Or are we identifying more and more with this infinite power that we feel moving in us, that we feel when we get still, when we chant, when we pray, when we're out walking in Lithia Park, right? <laughs> mm. So I'm going to share another quote from the Upanishad. It's, it's a little lengthy, but it's so powerful. That which comes out of the infinite whole must also be infinite. Hence, the self is infinite. That is the ocean. We are the drops. So long as the drops remain separate from the ocean, it is small and weak. But when it is one with the ocean, then it has all the strength of the ocean. 
Similarly, so long as man believes himself to be separate from the whole, he is helpless. But when he identifies himself with it, then he transcends all weakness and partakes of, his om of its omnipotent qualities. Omnipotent qualities. Yogananda, Paramahansa Yogananda wrote a song I used to sing. I used to sing for Anla. Um, I am a bubble, make me the sea. Do you remember that chant? I am a bubble, make me the sea, make me the sea. I think he was, he was meditating on that passage from the Upanishads. He loved the Upanishads. So I just feel like I wonder at this idea that we are God playing hide and seek with itself. Do you ever feel that? We're God playing this game of hide and seek. We've become this human form with consciousness and then gotten this enormous case of amnesia, right? And so eons go by and humans think they're limited. They think they die. They think they have to pray and beg to something outside of themselves to wake up, right? Beseeching, that's something that they're not. But I think maybe God wanted a really, really, really tremendous laugh, right? And it wanted a laugh that would last like 100 years, right? So it was this self-created, God-created play. It was this cosmic game of hide and seek. And so the God that we are, being infinitely intelligent, it hid very, very well, <laughs> right? And it's so well that, you know, there's been these thousands of years seeking it before it is finding itself again for the joy of it, right? Every moment we wake up a little more, we are that joyful returning. We are that God ever expanding itself. Hafiz talks about laughter. He says, what is laughter? What is laughter? It is God waking up. Oh, it is God waking up. It is the sun poking its sweet head out from behind a cloud you have been carrying too long, veiling your eyes and heart. It is light breaking ground for a great structure that is your real body called truth. It is happiness applauding itself and then taking flight to embrace everyone and everything in this world. Mm. So in closing, uh, may the one that we are wake up, wake up together. Let's wake up together in joy. Let's have a good laugh. Let's laugh as much as possible. <laughs> And let's embrace everyone and everything in this world as a part of ourselves, as a part of ourselves. You know, we might be embracing, you know, this part that's asleep, right? We might be embracing this part that's waking up grumpily, right? We might be embracing this part that's gloriously shining, right? But let's embrace it all and shine on it like the sun shines on us. So I hope this has been helpful. I'd like to close with some affirmations. Uh, would you repeat after me? I am life. I am love. I am fearless. I am whole. I bless all that I am. All is well. I love you all. <laughs> Thank you all. Om Shanti.